to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings 17. I am reading out of the NIV translation, so if you are on your phone, you can switch over to the NIV. You can use the Bibles underneath the seats, but it's not going to totally line up. So if that's going to be distracting, uh, by all means, we'll have it up on the screen here in a second. You can follow along that way, but just get to where you can see 1 Kings 17. Last time I was up here, we were in this series still, so Steps in Faith, today is our last day, and we talked about grounding, that in order to take a physical step, there has to be some solid ground under your feet from which you can take a step. And so we identified as God calls us to step out in faith, what is that grounding from which we can take that step in faith? Today, what we'll see as we walk through this scripture together is that every step in faith will cost you something. Like every single one. Any time that God calls us to take a step in faith, there will be a cost associated with that. So I really want to try to figure out and give language as to why that is. Like why, if, if, if God is trying to incentivize us to step out in faith and like follow him and be bold or whatever it is, why would there be a cost with that? Uh, if I was almighty God, I wouldn't be making my people pay something for that. I would just want to bless them. <laughs> if you're going to be incentivized, I want you to get some gifts if you're taking steps in faith. Because if that was the case, I'm not just taking one step. Nathan, I'm running down this aisle right here catching all the blessings on my way out like it can hit me in the face even. I don't care because I just want all the stuff to gain. But that's not quite how the actual God of the world has set things up. There's a cost that comes with that. And so we're gonna figure out why that is. And my hope is that when you leave today, you will have a better expectation so that when God does call you to take that step in faith, you, you know what's coming. You have expectation for that. It's not going to catch you off guard. But also, maybe there's someone in this room who, perhaps even years ago, you took a step in faith, and it came at a really big cost that you weren't prepared for. And ever since then, you've been angry. You've been bitter at God. My hope is that you would find some healing today, maybe some understanding. Now, before we look at verse 1, Let me tell you where we're at in history right now in this moment. God's people have been an established nation for quite some time, the Israelites. Unfortunately, the nation has splintered into two different kingdoms. There's the North Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. We are going to be in the Northern Kingdom. And the Northern Kingdom has quite a reputation for terrible leadership. It's it's awful. It's not good. But a new king has recently emerged on the scene, King Ahab. And so maybe things are going to be different. Maybe this guy's going to get it right. Let me read you a verse really quick from chapter 16. And I'm just going to let the Bible describe Ahab. Uh, Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. So not good, all right? (laughs) This is the worst we have ever had. It's so bad. It's so you, you can go read chapter 16. Like, this, this dude is next level, just terrible. So we got this new king, bad news bears. Now a new character is going to emerge in the story of Scripture, another name that you might be familiar with. Uh, it's his first time on the scene. And so let's get into it together. Look at 1 Kings 17, verse 1. Here we go. Now Elijah... There he is. I want you to reach out, touch someone next to you and say, there's Elijah. Touch someone next to you, say, there's Elijah. Here he is. This is the first time he's arrived on the scene in scripture. Elijah is here. He's a very famous prophet if you're unfamiliar with him. Now, Elijah the Tishbite from Tishba, go figure, in Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord Yahweh, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will neither be dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. 
This is a bold thing to say to a king, your first interaction with him, uh, let alone the most evil king we've ever had. It's just like no holds barred, like nothing held back. Elijah's like, all right, listen here, fool. Uh, there's gonna be no rain, no dew. Don't even think about condensation. Like none of that is about to take place unless I say so because of the power of Yahweh in me. So here he is right out of the gate, just challenging Ahab and his authority. And uh, it's gonna be really awkward if it rains in like six days because ugh, he's gone. So there's a lot on the line here. But uh, let's see what takes place. Verse two, then the word of the Lord Yahweh came to Elijah. Leave here and turn eastward. Hide in the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook and I've directed the ravens to supply you with food there. Already, we didn't even realize it, but a step in faith has been taken. Um, Elijah, <laughs> it, it's, it's not like he just rolled up into the king's court and like said this thing and was like, I got a plane to catch, I'm going to America. He lives in the same place as Ahab. Like it, your home is my home. Su casa es mi casa. I don't know Spanish, so I probably got that backwards. I just thought of that in this moment. Didn't practice that. Spanish. Anyways, uh, so Ahab and Elijah share a backyard. So if Elijah is telling Ahab, you're not getting any rain, guess who also isn't getting any rain? Elijah. So he didn't know where his water was gonna come from when he made this decree against Ahab. Apparently, God just told him, I want you to say this thing. And so he steps out in faith and says this to Ahab. And then on the back end, God says, all right, I've got this special place picked out for you. I want you to head east and there's a brook. And from this brook, you'll find water during the drought. And because I'm feeling extra saucy, I'm gonna send some ravens to feed you. And so this guy's got like ravens as butlers that are just coming in, bringing in meat and, f and bread and all this. It's, it's crazy. He didn't know that before, but he stepped out in faith. God provided for him. So verse five, Elijah did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, and he stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. God provides water, this brook for Elijah to sustain him during this drought. But now things take a turn. Verse seven, sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. What, how, how ridiculous would it have been if this brook dried up but Elijah like refused to leave because he knows that it's not raining until he says something. So who knows if he's gonna be able to find water elsewhere. He's been relying on this brook to give him water and now it's, come, it, it, it's run dry. How dumb would it be if he just stayed here hoping that maybe there's like an underground well or something that's just gonna spring forth water and like I'm gonna have sustenance because it provided for me in the past. I need this brook to give me water now. It would be ridiculous. But Elijah, he has his priorities in the right order. Instead of putting the provision above his provider, he has it the other way around. Elijah knows who his true provider is. It's God, it's Yahweh. God led him to this brook in the first place. So if God is my provider and he's given me this provision, then I can trust that he's gonna give me something else. And the thing is for us, God provides for us in very specific ways. He provided this very specific location and brook for Elijah, but oftentimes he provides in specific ways, but only for a specific season. Most of the time, God in his provision for us that are in individual ways for every one of us in this room, he's very specific when he provides for us. But oftentimes that provision is only meant to last for a specific season. I shared the last time that I was up here a little bit about how I actually arrived in Omaha. 
And it was very clear to me and my wife, Taylor, that the hand of the Lord was all over that situation. Like it was, it was very clear in a real supernatural way that God was leading us to Omaha as he led Elijah to this brook. He was leading us to Omaha. And it was all for a job at King of Kings, this church just up the street from here. And so for a, a season and for a time, God was leading us to this brook that was King of Kings. And it was from this brook that I was financially being cared for, that we had community to be a part of, and so many other things. It was this great source of life. Now, I thought this brook was gonna last a lot longer than it did because four years in, the brook ran dry. And when I found out that I was no longer gonna be working on staff there, I kid you not, this is the, the, the honest truth. I found out that I, was, I wasn't gonna be working there. My first instinct, purely by the grace of God, because I knew how I got here and I remembered who my provider was in this moment, that when they told me I was leaving, my first instinct, I was not afraid. I was not afraid, I was not scared. And the very, very first thing I thought is, Lord, I know you're gonna bring me somewhere else. I, I know that you are going to provide for me. I, I'm not afraid about what happens next. And it turns out, he provided another brook called Westwood Church. That this one ran out, and so God led me to a new place that's financially providing for my family, that's providing community for us, spiritual fulfillment. Now there's a new brook that we can drink deeply from. The months in between there were terrible, okay? It, it was awful in between, and there's kids in the room, so I can't say all my feelings, but like, it just was not the best, okay? I would never recommend that. It was the hardest season of all time. But that doesn't change the fact that God had provided in specific ways. And so rather than getting bent out of shape over this one drying up, I need to look to him and be reminded that this was never my provider, this was just provision. And so for some of us in this room, we have to be very careful that we don't get too stuck on the specific provision because the brooks in our life are going to dry up. None of them are eternal, but our Lord never runs out and he knows what is coming. And so Elijah doesn't get bent out of shape over his like physical water source running out. And here's what happens, verse eight. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and he asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I may have a drink? And as she was going to get it, he called, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord Yahweh, your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. I only have a handful of flour in a jar and a little bit of olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and to make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. This woman She's a widow. She is on the bottom rungs of the societal hierarchy because it's crucial that there's a man who can provide for you in this system. And so she doesn't have that. So she's destitute, she's got nothing. On top of that, she has a kid. And so this is a drain on her resources. So she's got nothing, no provision. And when Elijah meets her, we, she's just out gathering sticks, minding her own business. It turns out this is for her last meal. This widow only has enough flour and oil to make one final meal, and then she has consigned herself and her kid to death. There, there's a drought going on here, and she has just absolutely nothing. The only thing she has, the only thing she's clinging to is this last meal, and after that, it's just the abyss. And so she tells Elijah this, 
because his request is just too big. It's too big. I cannot feed you. This is all I have. And here's how Elijah responds. Verse 13, Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you've said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord Yahweh, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord Yahweh sends rain on the land. <laughs> it feels a little tone deaf because the order of operations here is very important. Uh, what Elijah could have said when she's like, I'm gathering sticks to eat one meal and I don't know, die after that. What he could have said is, hey, don't, don't worry, don't worry. You wanna know something crazy? God is gonna do this miracle and th that jar of flour and the jar of oil, you're not gonna believe it, but it's gonna just like keep pouring, just like bottles on bottles, just keep, that was, <laughs> they're just gonna keep, like it's not gonna run out and you're gonna have all this bread it, until the rain comes. God's gonna sustain you, it's gonna be awesome. So I want you to go home and just to test it out, make some bread, eat it, get full, feed your kid and then once you've seen that it's true, come and feed me. That is not what he says. He says, first, make me some bread. Feed me first, and then eat and feed your kid, and what you'll come to find is that it doesn't run out. Why does he do this? Why, like, why is this the order? Why, why does she have to make this sacrifice? Why does he require her to step out in faith at such an exorbitant cost to herself? This is all she has left. And Elijah says, you gotta give it up. You have to take a chance. You've got to make this gamble. And you do not know what's gonna happen on the other side. I worked at a church once and I got to be part of the confirmation program and the person who was running the program before me, they decided that they wanted to charge families um, kind of a cover fee as part of participating in this program. So confirmation is like a two year long thing for teenagers. And so it was like 150 bucks. And the reasoning for this charge, I kid you not, the person, the words were, I want them to have some skin in the game because you come to like Sunday school on Sunday and you're like, or you're like in bed and you're like, nah, I don't wanna get up, kids. Let's just make some pancakes. No big deal, right? Well, this person was hoping to incentivize people so that when Wednesday night rolled around and they're like, ugh, soccer practice. We gotta grab Taco Bell. I don't know if we wanna really like make this happen. We'll just skip this week. He wanted them to be like, 150 bucks, uh. <laughs> All right, we're going, kids, get in the car, I don't care. Put your socks on, like, get that thing off your head, we're going, all right? Because I want you to feel how much this is gonna cost you, okay, and have some skin in the game. Is this how the Lord works? Is this what he wants from this woman? Is for her to have some skin in the game? And that's why he requires her to make this sacrifice in the step of faith? Here's why it cost us so much to follow the Lord Jesus. The reason why it costs us to take a step in faith is because we put stock in so many other things in our life. We have put ourselves and spread ourselves into so many different areas. I, I'll be honest with you, not a great financial advisor, okay? Uh, see Paula Eastman, maybe. I don't know if she would say that her services are available. <laughs> Sorry, Paula, I just saw you and I thought, okay, Paula, anyways, moving on. Uh, I'm not a great financial advisor. Don't take my advice, okay? There's the caveat, but I have some ideas. I think they might pan out in the long run. We won't know, we'll see, babe. Well, who knows, okay? But what I do know is that from people who know what they're talking about, if you are considering your wealth and the future and success, you should diversify your portfolio. You need to just spread that thing out a little bit. In fact, touch someone next to you, say, diversify your portfolio. Touch someone next to you. You need to diversify your portfolio. <laughs> so uh, 
in that case, instead of just having all your money in this one bank account, you know, something could happen, it could collapse, whatever. Uh, let me tell you about my friends at Birch Gold. <laughs> you should uh, put some money in gold. Maybe if you're feeling lucky, put some money in silver. You should get into the stock exchange, Wall Street, buy some stocks, Disney, ugh, who knows? But this stock over here, get into that. Mutual funds, I'm just gonna start throwing a 401k, all the words that I know. You spread it out to hedge against things. If I'm spread, then if my bank gets hit, it's okay, I've got these other assets in these other places. Here is the issue. Our God is not a diversified portfolio God. He is not a spread yourself out and trust in these other things God. Our God is an all in kind of God. Our God is in all the chips, I am putting them on you. He is not okay with us putting stock in other things because he knows that these other things will fail us. When I, when I started college, I, I was the farthest from the Lord I think I've ever been in my life. I grew up in a Christian home. I knew the right verses. I knew the things to say. I was not a part of a church community. I did not worship him. All I cared about was getting high. I was being stupid with friends on the weekends, putting all kinds of things into my body. I didn't pray. I thought prayer was stupid. And I, 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 my, my career path at the time, I was going to be a professional counselor. And some of you hear that and you're like, well, you dodged a bullet there. I'm glad you, <laughs> thanks God for saving some people. Um, maybe, we'll never know. But, but the reason how I came to that career field is because nothing else, I couldn't do anything else. I couldn't do finance, couldn't do math, couldn't do any of that. So all of my future was here. It, it was this or nothing else. So all of my hopes, all of my dreams, my whole, all right there. And it came down to one summer, the summer going into my junior year. And I had to make a decision for a summer job. I, I was gonna work at a summer camp and it was a decision between two camps. I needed it for my resume to go into counseling. And the two camps, one of them was an all boys camp and it was Christian in name, and I think they like pulled out a guitar on the very last day and were like, let's sing some hymns, kid, and then you're on your way. The rest of the week, it was like jet skis, blob, baseball fields, football, and I'm like, yes, let's do this. The other camp was like mad Jesus all the time, just Jesus, 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 and I wanted nothing to do with it, and I will tell you, that above all else, the reason, the main reason why I did not want to work at the Jesus camp was because I was so worried about what my friends would think when I got back. I, I was so worried that I would go to this camp and something would change and I would come back, one of those weird Bible beating, praying all the time, you know, like, actual followers of Jesus. I was so terrified of what my friends would think. I was so worried that I would lose this community that I had spent so much time and put so much of my personal identity into that I was not willing to make that sacrifice. But it all came down to a phone call with my mom. The Holy Spirit was moving through her. He was kind of strong arming me a little bit. It was a little bit unfair, but I made the decision in a moment of desperation. I was like, fine, mom, if you'll be quiet, I'll work at this camp. That's all Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And here I am, Jesus, 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 Jesus. I had to put all of these things on the line and I had to step out in faith and it cost me everything. When you take a step, there will be a cost. But it's not because God is enacting or exacting some price from you. It's because we have put stock in all these other things. And so when we come to the Lord and when he calls us to step out in faith, the question is, are we willing to risk what we have put our trust in? 
Are we willing to risk what we've put our identity in? Are we willing to risk the things and the brooks and the provision in our life? Are we willing to put that all on the line and take a chance on him and put all of our chips in on Jesus? Because that's exactly what this woman did. And she had bread that lasted the rest of the drought. Let me, let me watch how this story finishes out. Verse 15, she went away and she did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord Yahweh spoken by Elijah. She took a chance. She stepped out in faith. She put her literal life on the line and came to God and brought the, the bread to Elijah and God came through. His word was true. He provided for her and she needed nothing after that because the Lord God became her provider. And it reminds me of a time when Jesus was speaking and he told his followers, he said, hey, whoever loses their life for my sake, you're actually gonna gain your life. If you are willing to risk it on God, if you were willing to step out in faith and you're willing to put it on the line, Jesus says, whoever loses their life will gain their life. It's this backwards transaction because of the things that we've put stock in. And on that day when I said, yes, I'm going here, what I lost could not even come close to comparing with where I am today because I found Jesus and he met me and he changed my heart, he changed my life, he gave me a hope, he gave me a future, he healed so many things in my life and you would not even recognize the person that I was to who I am today and it's all because he empowered me to take that step in faith. And so I wanna close and share this with you because as I was reading the story, I noticed something. Here's this woman who needs bread and Elijah comes on the scene and he gives her bread, but not only does he give her bread, it's like bread that doesn't run out, at least until the drought comes. And it reminded me of another time in Jesus's life. Jesus, there was a crowd who gathered before him and Jesus miraculously provided bread. This bread that just kept coming, it just kept multiplying. They're like, what is going on right now? <laughs> and so this crowd ate the bread that was unending and they were so full and they left and Jesus went to a different place. And then they all like went after him and they, ca they caught up to him later and they're hungry. And they're like, we want some more bread, man. You got any more of that good stuff? Come on, where's that bread? And look at what Jesus says to them. I'm just gonna read this for you. So just hear these words. Jesus then declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never grow hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you've seen me and still you don't believe. All those that the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me, I will never drive them away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those that he has given to me, but I would raise them up on the last day. And here it is, for my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son, Jesus, and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. May you find the courage to take a step in faith. May you find the courage that as God leads you out into uncharted territory, my prayer is that you would be emboldened in that moment that you would be willing to come before the Lord with whatever scraps you have, with whatever stocks you've put in other places, with whatever it is, and say, God, I'm willing to risk this. I'm willing to risk what I've built. I'm willing to put it on the line, and I'm gonna step out in faith. And it's gonna be scary. It's gonna be hard. It's gonna be difficult, but I'm doing it because I know there's better because I know you will provide, because I know you will come through, because I know that you are good. And so I hope that you will come to Jesus today, that you will come to him and see him as your provider. It is only in Jesus that we find a truly satisfying life. 
It is only in Jesus that we find hope for the future. It is only in Jesus that we find salvation from our sins. It is only in Jesus that we have eternal life. It is only in Jesus that all of our needs can be met and fulfilled now and for eternity. Are you willing to take the step? Let me pray for us, and I'm gonna ask that we would just stand during this prayer. So would you stand, and and I'm gonna pray for us. Father, we thank you for the witness of Scripture. We thank you that hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, uh, there was a woman, a widow, who was on the verge of death, who had one meal left. And you came to her and you filled her with hope. You told her that if she was willing to take this step, she wouldn't actually have to die she wouldn't actually have to lose her life, but instead she would find a new life. And I pray for everyone in this room and everyone online and everyone who hears this. First and foremost, we thank you for the ways you've provided for us. We thank you for the brooks that you've given in our lives, like Elijah, that sustain us, that give us life, whether it be a job, whether it be a family, a relationship, whatever it might be, we thank you for it. But Lord, we want to acknowledge today that there are seasons. And for someone in this room, a season has just come to a close. The job is no more. The relationship has been lost. The person has passed on or moved on or whatever it might be. And I pray for that person in this moment that they would not be afraid. That they would come to you and trust that you are going to lead them to another brook. And I pray, Lord, that as you call us to take steps in faith, we would know there's a cost, but that we would recognize we have so much more to gain. So here's what I want to do. I want to ask you to just keep your eyes closed. And if you're in this room right now, and there's a specific step of faith that God is calling you to, I want you to think about that. If you know that there's a cost that's going to come with it, I want you to raise your hand. It's just me with my eyes open. It's it's only me and you that are going to see this. If you're aware of the cost that's coming, would you please raise your hand because I want to pray for you. I'm not going to call you out by name. Thank you. I see you. I see you back there. Yep. Keep them up. Keep them up. Lord, I pray for those who have raised their hands. They know the cost. is It's right here. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would fill them today and give them courage to take this step. Fill them up with your spirit and remind them that there is so much to gain. That no matter what we lose in this earth, in this lifetime, that there is so much more coming. And that even now in the loss and in the pain, you are good. So God, give them the courage thank you for their boldness. You can put your hands down. And Father, I pray finally for those that didn't raise their hands. I thank you for them and their boldness. And that as you call them into steps of faith, would you give them courage by the power of your spirit? That they would feel emboldened to step out, trusting that you will come through because you have so many times before. We love you, Lord, and we trust our lives to you.